In 2003, after the release of Shin Megami Tensei Free Nocturne, Koji Okada, also known as Koji Okada, left the Atlas studio he had once co-founded in 1986. He had comprised the original team behind Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei, alongside Kazuma Kanaku and a couple others who are no longer part of Atlas, such as Ryutaro Ito, Ayane Nishitani, and Kazunari Suzuki. After 2009, with the release of Shin Megami Tensei Strange Journey, Kazuma Kanaku seemingly took a back seat within the Atlas company, and with him, longtime writer and planner Shugo Isugai. Shuji Meguro's last soundtrack on an official SMT game was for Strange Journey as well, transitioning towards the Persona spin-off series and other additions until his leave in 2021. Kanaku and Isugai's disappearances coincided with a corporate shuffling in Atlas, as it receded from the studio it once was into a mere brand of the Index Corporation in 2010, then later Sega in 2013. Since then, all of these people, if credited on new works, are done so for their past designs, such as Kaneko's art still in use, or Shogo's writing credits on the Nocturne remaster. The only exception being Kaneko's initial scenario writings that formed the basis for SMT4's story. Nevermore does this seem more conspicuous than now after the reception to Shin Megami Tensei 5 is poured in and we are able to confront the design choices in its making. We must remain aware that these changes were pronounced after Atlas's merger from 2010 to 2013, making it inherent to the latest two main installments, SMT4 and 5. Within these new teams of writers and designers, it feels there has been a fundamental problem peeking through in both installments and sure as well as the series goes forward. That is, that Shin Megami Tensei is suffering from losing its identity, as it has transitioned ahead. But I'm not simply pinning this on the loss of the original staff, but rather in how this relatively new staff has taken on the mantle and dealt with the foundational structure of Shin Megami Tensei itself. Though it should be noted that this may partially be a product of corporate oversight. Particularly, we may look at what made Shin Megami Tensei stand out since its inception. For one, its element of mythology. For another, this quote-unquote new SMT has also attempted to capture what made previous games intriguing, from SMT4 to 4 Apocalypse being a sort of retelling of SMT1 and SMT2, and SMT5 being a spiritual sequel to SMT3. But quite frankly, in neither case has this really worked, and I believe this is a symptom of the company's inability to grasp old SMT, or perhaps their lack of care for what SMT entails. The one thing that always lured me into and fostered my love for Shin Megami Tensei was its use of mythology. Sure, you may have series like Final Fantasy and Fate that have mythological figures in them, but never does this pass a surface level usage of their namesake. Or, if it does, it takes significant liberties with the respective legends to fit into what is needed for the story rather than what fits their mythology. To be sure, there's a range on how you can balance mythology and story, but in recent installments, it feels as if SMT has crashed to the latter side. Alongside this, as the story begins to take precedence over the mythology being interwoven into its narrative, it feels as if humanity takes precedence and indeed erases over the importance of angels and demons. It's not as if previously the series were perfect in mythological accuracy. After all, the design behind the demon Scotty reflected an inaccurate and outdated interpretation, and Arahabaki's narratives may have been influenced by forgery. But, as the series has moved forward starting from Shin Megami Tensei 4, this has become more than what was an authorial idiosyncrasy, feeling rather like a lack of much of any authorial voice, along with corporate meddling. To start with, demon design and portrayal starting from Shin Megami Tensei 4 has undergone a stark change, reflecting a development in the treatment of mythology. Shin Megami Tensei 4 itself was no masterpiece, and much of the reason for why it seems many praise this quote-unquote new SMT this scheme ushered in and ignore the problems inherent within it is because these same people started out with Shin Megami Tensei 4 as their introduction to the series as a whole. This game is also very noticeably transitional when it comes to art design as well, 
as it cycled through Masayuki Doi, Tamutsu Shinohara, Yasushi Nirasawa, Kiyuma Aki, Yoshihiro Nishimura, and Kieta Amamiya. One will notice the prevalence of tokusatsu artists here, as well as the influence this had on Shin Megami Tensei 4. The problem with this new art design, general art criticisms aside, is that few of it actually accommodates the mythology it is depicting, or if it does, it depicts it erroneously. And it similarly contradicts the series' design prior. The stand goes hand in hand with their characterization. When one goes about depicting mythological figures, there is a fundamental difference between, say, Fate and Shin Megami Tensei. Take, for example, the battle against Tiamat in Fate Grand Order. Sure, it incorporates surface level or popular aspects of the mythology of Tiamat, but design-wise, and in the treatment and role of the story, she could be replaced with anything else, or not even be represented as a mythological figure at all. Though both Tiamat in Fate and Shin Megami Tensei Strange Journey share their role as mother goddesses and an origin point for humanity and other beings, their relation is entirely different. Fate Tiamat is almost incidentally a mother goddess and becomes an antagonistic force out of a perceived necessity of survival against her creations, rather than any real and active role as the mother goddess she is. She's taken out of her seal on the world on the reverse side back into material reality in order to destroy humanity. Art-wise, she is depicted as little more than a buxom woman and then a bright red evil demon with horns and dragon-like wings. Shin Megami Tensei's Tiamat, or at least Strange Journeys, is also acting against humanity but still fulfilling her role as mother goddess by birthing and rebirthing demons. Her actions against humanity are innate to her nature as a deity and part of the Schwarzfeld, awakening upon its activation for this purpose. She fulfills her role as Mother Goddess. We see this reflected in her design from her relation to the sea and fertility, along with her image as seen in the Enuma Elish. Essentially, Shin Megami Tensei past Strange Journey has become more and more like fate. We see this first with art design, then with story writing. Let's track this chronologically to see how this has evolved over time, though obviously I won't be able to cover all demon designs. One of the first enemies you encounter in Shin Megami Tensei 4 is Nipaya, mythologically types of forest nymphs. Yet there is nothing Greek nor Shin Megami Tensei in this design. It instead looks like it's from any other generic RPG, as it comes across as very pop, even idol-like. Though the Minotaur boss by and large has the best design, later bosses do not fare as well, such as Asmodeus. This one has little to do with any previous depictions of Asmodeus, or his nature as the sin of lust or as a king. Overall, both in story and design, He's just a generic demon, and could be replaced with anything else. The demon Dullahan looks fine, but it's weird that mechanical designs have become an artistic theme, especially when in this case it doesn't even reflect anything on the part of Dullahan, as you could argue for the angels later. The archangels and angels of Merkaba's realm are too portrayed as mechanical, fitting with the theme of law stripping all individuality unique to SMT4. I suppose this is also to be reflected in design, but disregarding the inconsistency at which angels are portrayed, the archangels look like eldritch beings that make the law route seem untenable. After all, it hardly appeals to the divine nature of the biblical angels and their ideals when they take on an outright demonic look. Michael even takes on a serpentine appearance, being fused with a snake rather than traditionally depicted as slaying it or standing above it. Lucifer and Merkaba don't escape either, with Merkaba's serpent tail, or Lucifer's alien look and skinny jeans. Lucifer as a character takes on a completely active role rather than as the influencer he was in previous games. Similarly, we see Merkaba chide Isabu for reading manga, which, in the context of a series that markets to otaku, 
makes Law look more silly than anything, owing to this game's bias for the neutral alignment. And though both are a little more polished in For Apocalypse, Lucifer more so than Merkaba, the depiction is still notably distinct. Mythological figures are informed by their observation and are thus unchanging in form. Yet, Odin takes on the look of a Kamen Rider rather than the magician and sage figure he was. Dagda walks about as some edgelord nihilist Skeletor who rants against the power of friendship instead of the jolly and fatherly quote-unquote good god he originally was described as in Human Observation. While Shin Megami Tensei designs have typically incorporated the old and the modern, as per the very concept of the story, the modern never smothered the old, as that would completely defeat the purpose of wanting to depict mythological figures in the first place. Cleopatra is not a deity of any sort to begin with, and is associated with snakes purely out of the legend of her death and nothing more. Idun is clearly modelled after an idol, despite being a Nordic goddess. Mitra and Buddha have no connection between the two in any capacity. Satan across Shin Megami Tensei and in Four Apocalypse functions as the Judaic variant, which is an angel loyal to God, yet his depiction in Four Apocalypse is that of the New Testament Satan, with the seven heads and the chains that drag him down to hell. Amanozaku looks like a pixie and mascot character, and acts like one too, and Lucifer's form in Shin Megami Tensei 5 is terribly gaudy and ridiculous, but I'll get more into Lucy in the next section. There are many, many other designs to pick apart and probably other bad trends that I won't be able to note in this video. But the worst trend by far has been Shin Megami Tensei wanting to transcend its mythological boundaries, not simply in depicting the existing figures, but in how these figures integrate with its narratives. The arbitrary necessity of Walter and Jonathan to fuse for Lucifer and Merkaba to regain their full power must have certainly been a prelude to the Nahobino concept. In Shin Megami Tensei 5, a Nahobino is a forbidden being relating to God stealing knowledge from gods and thus demonizing them. When humans are tempted to buy into the apple of knowledge by Lucifer, they are banished by God and now contain this knowledge. In this game, the only way for demons to find their true form again is by finding their human counterpart. This is ignoring the fact that they are displayed in their full form to begin with, but I digress. The fundamental problem with this concept is that it diminishes mythological figures into being little more than second-class entities to humans, and creates no difference between angels and demons. For the Nahobinu is a special in-universe entity that is greater than any god or demon that the series depicts. And of course, you are such an entity. The quote-unquote true neutral ending, much like the neutral ending in Shin Megami Tensei 4, most obviously favored in canon, suffers too from the same problem of feeling debilitatingly loathsome towards the very mythology the series is centered around. Both these endings end in essentially eliminating all demons and angels to create a Tokyo or even a world without them. Not only is this per series rules impossible, but it's not even desirable. Why craft such a world with mythological creatures made very real yet ultimately make it a mission to discard it all? In the past, the neutral alignments often meant a balancing act between the two forces for the sake of humanity. Shin Megami Tensei 1's neutral weren't even lead you to lousy. But these new endings are outright rejections. Rejecting the entire thing the series is built on, and not simply killing Yahweh or Lucifer, but erasing demons. The Shin Megami Tensei 5 true neutral ending comes across more as a Persona ending, where their newfound powers are erased at the end and everything goes back to normal. Even in Strange Journey, the threat of the demons is continuous. The Schwarzfeld is an inevitability because demons themselves are a part of the world as much as humans. New Shin Megami Tensei comes across as prioritizing JRPG power fantasies than giving respect to the mythology it depicts in its narrative. Another problem one runs into with this Nahobino concept, especially with Abdiel's ascension into such a being, is that angels can't be Nahobino because knowledge was only taken away from rival gods, 
resulting in their demonization. Angels and Archangels, if not of purely divine or human origin, are at the very least not originating from gods or demons. Metatron and Sandalphin being from Enoch and Elijah being an example of human origin. However, Abdiel becomes an Ahobinu by fusing with Dazai. To explain this, Melchizedek in a side quest relates that the Seraphim were once gods that served the Baal. This, of course, reflects no reality and is entirely made up to explain the mythological whole to back up an isolated plot point. An easy example of it preferring its own internal story over the mythology it's depicting. Another problem with the Nahobino concept comes in Tao, or as she becomes later, the Goddess of Creation. Nahobino in Shintoist mythology seem to be purification deities created from Izanagi to cleanse disasters wrought by Magatsuhi. Perhaps Tao is supposed to be Izanome, which is born alongside Nahobino, but I really don't know considering the Nahobino concept is a Shinto idea become globalized, and Tao is given a generic title as Goddess. It's much like the Goddess of Tokyo in Shin Megami Tensei 4, which doesn't exist and is entirely a plot device. Curiously, the Goddess of Creation is a member of a unique Panagia race, which is of Greek Christian origin, and Tao herself is referred to as a saint. An unusual cultural combination to say the least, and for what reason? Who knows. The issue of bear emulation seems to have become apparent to everyone with Shin Megami Tensei 5 attempting to reproduce the formula of Nocturne. Before this, however, we had the Shin Megami Tensei 4 duology mimicking the first two games. I, as well as most others at the time, passed this off as a tribute, but in retrospect with Shin Megami Tensei 5's similar failure in direction, this shouldn't have been excused. To explain why, we should take a look at where Shin Megami Tensei 5 failed. Shin Megami Tensei 5 strives to encapsulate what made Nocturne so memorable. That minimalistic direction aiding in its sense of solitude and the bare knuckle fight for survival. But for Shin Megami Tensei 5, minimalism turns into a lack of any direction. It has often been said of Nocturne that its story is too simple or even non-existent. But this is conflating its creative direction and style with the actual story itself. The best Shin Megami Tensei 5 is able to successfully replicate this feeling of Nocturne is in the first area, the Minato Ward of Da'at. And this is because of a surface level sense of solitude and survival in a desolate environment of former Tokyo. However, this promising start is broken apart into mediocrity. After planting you into this desolate environment and a pure fight for survival, it then hits the player with whiplash by chaining you to the baffle organization, making you feel aimlessly strung along to do their bidding despite not knowing their deal as it piles doting characters upon you. So many plot points and characters are suddenly thrust upon you with little to no levity and too much space in between. The fact that the real world Tokyo is essentially an artificial reality created relatively recently is brought up and almost immediately forgotten, with barely a noted reaction by any of the cast. Worst of all, it juxtaposes the previous other world with a return to a school setting in that world right after, destroying much of the momentum of the story at both points and really just being a confusing decision. It is here where we encounter the Lamu and Sahori plotline, which is entirely propelled by school bullying. A story more fitted for Persona than anything else. Lamu even attaches onto Sahori's insecurities like a Persona. Now, sure, most games started from a school setting, and previous games like Shin Megami Tensei 1 have this incorporated into their characters. But this is different from the chaos hero in Shin Megami Tensei 1, who had his motivations informed by school bullying as well. The Chaos Hero's plight was melded into the story without a discrepancy of setting, along with his character still existing on its own beyond that low motivation being the sole reason for his alignment. It doesn't feel incongruent and the setup feels natural, though at least Sahori's simple motivation is then transformed into a broader story idea, 
making for a decent story buildup, even if it makes her little more than a forcible plot tool. Ichiru and Yuzuru, on the other hand, especially due to the extended periods that they stand around as characters, seem to stick out in their lack of tangible development. Ichiru fares better than his Chaos equivalent, but much like Walter and Jonathan, long stretches of development seem to be missing. Partway through, it's as if Yuzuri's sister is forgotten despite it being the main reason for his membership in Bethel, and his motivation to protect Tokyo. Then he simply backs the Prime Minister in Bethel from there on out without much else. The Prime Minister himself also lacks much interest. The reveal of Aogami as an incarnation of Suzanne comes as little surprise and isn't really treated with much levity as a twist and neither is the PM's reveal as Tsukuyomi. Not to mention, Aogami doesn't at all act like Suzanne O, even if it may work story-wise. Suzanne O, both in mythology and in previous incarnations of the series, is characterized as a god of rage and war, yet Aogami is just her usual boring, stoic guide for the protagonist. Ichiro's development, though with more organic events, still doesn't quite go from point A to point B in a tangible way, to the point that his eventual transformation is out of nowhere and quite laughable. It's just a complete change to his character with some plot buildup but no necessary characterization behind it. It's as if characters only exist to fulfill their roles as Law Hero and Chaos Hero. Walter and Jonathan suffer the scene when, much like the Nahobinu, they fuse into their representatives. But even worse ideologically, Merkaba and Lucifer are of a much more extreme ilk than what had been built up for the characters, especially Jonathan. Merkaba's ultimatum is dumped upon them of its extreme implications which would pressure Jonathan's morals, but instead his hesitance comes solely from the threat of death. Even the beginning of Shin Megami Tensei 4, where it attempts to emulate the dream sequence of SMT1, feels like a surface level imitation, where the characters spell out their story role to you rather than the vague mystic nature of the original, along with their simple motivations that develop into something bigger. The SMT4 characters practically make it known to you from the start that they function as little more than the player's binary philosophy roots, at times contradicting what little amount of characterization they have. It's curious that both recent installments have insisted on following the strictness of straight chaos and law hero reps, seen only in SMT1 and Strange Journey, especially as SMT2 and Nocturne, which they also attempt to emulate, broke free of these previous linearities. SMT4's early promises peak around the Minotaur stage, where, much like SMT5, it is able to capture the feeling of the original it is emulating, along with standing on its own as well. But no stage past this can compare, as it feels like it's going through the motions the entire time. The trifling alignment in SMT4 is made even worse in the neutral routes, where it stops you dead in your tracks to collect literal hope from humanity into a cup by doing a load of side quests. Not only does this have no meaning, it is entirely contrived, and feels like a shounen manga long past its peak. It also completes the Goddess of Tokyo plotline with a Burroughs reveal, but who cares? It's entirely insignificant outside of the most superficial of ways, and in SMT4 Apocalypse, it's whatever there anyways, with Steven even being the one to abandon it. Another point of comparison comes in the handling of two returning characters, Steven and Lucifer. While doing things differently can be welcome, inconsistency and resurrecting old points just to poorly service a weak story point is not. With characters as well as plot points, it feels as if it's simply reminding you of past ideas to assure you that it's still Shin Megami Tensei. Like, remember Steven? Remember Lucifer? Remember Jack Frost? Remember Yahweh? Remember Demonicus? Steven is the most notable, as it feels like SNT4 writers picked him up simply out of recognition and blew him up into a figure that he never was some mystic guy that teleports back and forth like it's the Matrix, or some kind of bargain Benji-man. Previously in 1 and 2, he was just a scientist. 
he improved his demon summoning programs for seemingly humanity's benefit. He once appeared as a practical experimenter, and then in 4, prattles on about the goddess of Tokyo and becomes a fanservice super boss. Lucifer is a whole other can of worms. His consistency as an elusive manipulator in the backlines is replaced with a raging teenager in 4, then a gaudy forced final boss in 5. But it's his depiction in 5 that annoys me the most. In SMT5, Lucifer successfully rebels against the god of law and absorbs his knowledge, becoming essentially the most powerful being. We hear him speak from afar at the beginning of the story, to Abdiel at the post-summit in a very unsubtle appearance, and finally at the end when you lock your alignment choice, before suddenly appearing as a final boss. He insists that a system will exist afterwards that will ensure the return of Da'at and the cycle of Nahobino slain Nahobino to shape the world again, and that this is somehow stopped by just slaying him. Despite having flashes of build-up across the story, his entrance feels forced. Like the writers realized they didn't have a final boss due to Yahweh not existing, so Lucifer was the next best thing. Not to mention, his story relevance ends up being lazy. Apparently, Lucifer did nothing after becoming Nahobinu, because of the simple fact of transcending upon eating the Law God's knowledge. Not only that, but he has no motivation of his own besides tempting the creation of Nahobinu, and apparently wanting someone to take his place. Compare his elusiveness in Nocturne to here where it actually feels like he has a purpose across the story, and his existence as a true final boss feels earned, and still aligns with his clearly stated motivations. Not only that, but in Shin Megami Tensei V's true neutral ending, you erase all demons, despite the fact that the ending requires you to help and forge alliances with demons, including Finn McCool, Kansu, Amanazaku, the Goddess of Creation, etc. And then, finally, Lucifer stamps his signature onto it, despite him in previous games directly stating his ultimate allegiance with his demonic kin. Shin Megami Tensei V's failure to recapture Nocturne's luster seems to have stemmed from the lack of creative direction, along with a failure in negligible storytelling. A great contrast comes to SMT4's focus on storytelling, which then feels to be anything more than a stock standard by the very limitations it set upon itself. It seems SMT today has lost itself. It can only conjure up an image of SMT that once existed as an illusion, and its references and emulation feel fragile and thin. Once they run out of things to emulate, what then? What will an SMT6 be a retelling or spiritual sequel of? Some future installments seem keen on dropping the Shin Megami Tensei label altogether, which, for better or worse, seems to ironically be the future of the franchise. And to clarify as well, I do not hate Doi. He is a talented artist, and it will be interesting to see him continue to grow. And I don't bear any aversion to particular writers or developers simply on account of them being new. The first Devil Survivor, for example, despite feeling a little clean, was a very welcome change of pace and I consider it one of my favourite titles in the series. I will continue to give future titles their fair chance. These are all a condensed version of my considerations given my disappointment with recent titles, so take it as you will.